Hello and welcome to the Panache Cast. This is Panache Software's legal tech podcast, giving you all the information on the latest news and events in the world of legal tech. Um, you'll notice a slight change from last week in that it's no longer mentioned as a weekly podcast. Mm. Uh, we've been pretty good at weekly so far, but we, we, we had a few gaps. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we've, we've decided to move to a um, sort of fortnightly show um, and we're, we'll explain some of these, the, the items around that later. Mm. Um, but it's primarily, there's a lot of exciting development going on in the platform that we're building mm. at the moment, um, for which we just need a bit more time to focus on those aspects. Uh, and also, uh, and we're hoping to announce some of those things shortly, mm. um, which, which we'll keep you posted on. Um, but also, we just want to give ourselves a bit more time to do some other aspects as well and provide some additional information for you, um, a lot of which Neil's going to cover shortly. Um, but we're going to keep with fortnightly for the moment. Um, this week, we're going to talk about a couple of ep- episode, uh, a couple of news items. Um, these are Blake Morgan's consolidation and move to Peppermint CX, uh, and whether DIY wills are to blame for thirty percent increase in probate claims. Um, but before we get into that, and to give you a bit more information on this, on the items, uh, I want to welcome my co-host as well, Neil Pemberton. Thanks, Pete. Uh, and he's going to let you know. Um, well, you've noticed that not only have we gone from weekly to fortnightly, but we've gone from our usual three subjects to two. Um, and that's because what we really want to do is start uh, giving a bit more information about things that we think people will find useful uh, and an actual tangible benefit that people can take away and start using and implementing in their firm straight away. So we've got um, some stuff coming up. Third item on the show, we'll be talking about legal project management, but we were focusing on uh, on that uh, in this episode and several future episodes as well we're going to be working our way up to it I'm not sure whether or not do, is, is fortnightly a word that's used in the states i can't remember i know we've got thousands of viewers in the states i don't know we t- could t- say twice monthly twice monthly uh, bi-monthly every, every something other, like that every other week try anyway. and cover all the bases of there uh... <laughs> anyway the news the news coming from our perspective is huge and so um we wanted to try and Sort of reduce the, the news the news reports from uh, from that we're reporting of other people's news. Um, not that we're making our own news yet, but um, hopefully we will be. I'm sure we might we might do at some point. We, yeah. we're, we're hoping to make some news, we'll uh, make some news later in the year. We'll make some um, news, make some big waves. Yeah. So uh, so there's a two changes to the content of the show, um, and the legal project management thing is is a big it's a big topic right now. Um, Lots of the big firms are going around hoovering up um, project managers and they have all types of variety of, of background experience. Some are lawyers, some are project management specialists, some are management consultants. And I think now a lot of people are just branding themselves as legal project managers specifically. Yeah. So uh, for the firms that are out there that don't have necessarily the resource or the inclination to, to take that kind of um, personnel on, um, we're conscious that not everybody can, and uh, but it, but project management is is something that is quite big right now. I think everybody could get something from it. So anyone who's not implementing a systems or project management uh, solution and or um, procedure that will have something to benefit from in this yeah, year. Yeah, it's one of those aspects where I think you can you can look at it and you can say, okay, I'm a very small firm or I'm mm. a single person firm, um, you know, on the high street do I need to do legal project management? What's the mm. point? Um, you know, isn't this only for larger firms where they can hire in management mm. consultants and things? And I think we want to cover and show you that actually some of these things may be of benefit to you as well. Yeah. Uh, and okay, you may, you, you don't want to pay someone to come in and do these things, but we want to take you through some of the steps that you can do these things yourself yeah. uh, or at least get started on. on Absolutely. It's about getting started and um, we will have several uh, several goes at this and because it's, it, it, it is not necessarily going to be an overnight fix for people. But, and it's um, a big topic in it, itself. It, so. It's a massive topic in itself and we want, to, um, we want to sort of drip feed the information across and also the resources for people to use. So Anyone that's interested in getting that will remind you later on. But if you just email us at uh, contact at panachesoftware.com or what's it called? Panachecast at panachesoftware.com. Either of those email addresses, we will send you um, some materials so that you can have a look and uh, and see what we're what we're doing and hopefully make use of those resources straight away. Yeah. Um, and, and it's important to note that although we're talking about legal <clears throat> project management and you may think, well, 
what does that have to do with a legal tech podcast, for instance? Mm. Um, there are a lot of overlaps where, you know, legal project management will help you identify where there may be gaps in your suite of tools mm. and may give you ideas as to where you could use these things and yeah. also potentially give you ideas of where it's not suitable to use them. You know, yeah. if you're looking to embark on a tech project and and take some new technology and new solutions to help with your business first off you need to have an in-depth knowledge of what your business is doing yeah um exactly. so these kind of things do run hand in hand really absolutely yeah we've got some resource which i'll refer to later on in the show that will back up what we're saying about those two things you know going hand hand in hand yep. um so just a reminder for anyone uh, that wants to get in touch, the best way to do so is on the Patreon website for us, which is patreon.com forward slash panache software. Anyone who wants a fabulous T-shirt like this uh, or in different colors, we can send them to you, provided, of course, that you take a membership level, which I think is yeah. associate level plus. Um, you don't have to, of course, but this is the page that we're using to put out our material and hopefully, hopefully raise some awareness and some support for what we're doing. So... Um, the idea being, of course, that uh, the more followers and more subscriptions that we get, the better the show gets, the better the quality gets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, yeah. Patreon.com forward slash Panache Software for that. So, should we move on to the news then? Yes, yeah, definitely. Let's get to the um, So, item number one, as Pete said, is an article that we found in Legal IT Insider. Its um, title is Blake Morgan Consolidates PMS into Peppermint CX. Um, we'll put a link to a what you need in the, in the show notes afterwards. But I just want to read a couple of paragraphs from the article. Uh, Blake Morgan has successfully consolidated all of its practice management systems into Peppermint CX, creating a single view of the client and removing the need for multiple records in multiple systems. Now, can you cue the hallelujah music here, please, Pete? <laughs> I think it's needed in these situations. Absolutely. <laughs> this kind and, of um, thing. <laughs> well, when we get some more finances for uh, for uh, better editing of shows, we can part. We can we can start doing that. So, if anyone wants to, we may be able to afford the royalties to pay on the, <laughs> if we use any licensed music. <laughs> Han- anyway, I think Handel died long enough, and that's not have to it's pay, probably not, fine. His, not yeah, have to pay version. him any music. I'm not. I'm not going for any modern day. Um, no, Simon probably, Cowell, hallelujah version. Yeah, we probably can't afford those no. renditions. But, uh. Anyway, back to the article. Um, as of last year, staff had a single time recording tool, method of billing, and approach to closure and archiving of files. The client matter inception has also been developed to provide an end-to-end process that captures the information required by their legal teams and also provide the basis for the firm to utilize the built CRM database capabilities in Peppermint in the future. Um so this is sort of harking back to the idea that we've mentioned before, and it's great validation for us, really, that the idea of and the concept of using a single platform where at all possible is significantly more advantageous. And maybe even and the analogy that I've used before is to say solving 10% of 10 problems rather than 100% of one. Um, here's a here's a real example of Blake Morgan, which is a big and respected firm doing just that, where they've seen an opportunity to tackle several problems and it might not be the 100% or best solution in any one of their you know, problems, if you like, but they've decided that this single platform, one login, one username, presumably one password is the best way for them to do that. Yeah. So it's great to see validation of that. Yeah, and, and I think that's a key thing you mentioned there is that it is we've talked uh, and heard about this and, and experienced ourselves, this mm. fatigue of... Yeah using all these different systems mm. whereby you're at a firm somewhere and you're using a time recording solution and then someone implements a brand new dashboard solution so now you've got to get a login for that mm-hmm. uh, and look at your stuff there oh now i've got to log into the finance system i've I've recorded my time here but i've actually got to submit my timesheets in this other system um and and it mm. does give a fatigue for your employees and and it means that people are less likely to use these products. Yeah. Um, I would also suggest that it would be almost, not impossible, but but harder to, for you to get sort of real-time information as well. If you're using a single time recording and billing platform, then as you are recording the time, I suspect it's easier to show the client how much is on the clock. Because what you often get questions of how much, how much have you got in terms of work in progress? What's the whip? Um, 
And the answer is, well, the whip as of yesterday, assuming everyone's closed their time and not including today, is this. Or you whip round an email to everyone who's working on the matter and yeah. say, can everyone close their time and tell me how much you've got on the clock today so that I can give the client a more accurate update? Well, if you're using something like this, which is the same billing and uh, time recording pl- package, I suspect, I don't know, but I suspect that it's it's you get a much more accurate reading of that. And you yeah. can probably allow the client to see for themselves. Yeah, I mean, I, I've been involved in a huge amount of implementations of sort of ERP solutions, so enterprise relationship solutions. Um, and invariably, part of that uh, implementation is related to um, integrating with other systems and pushing data out to mm. large data warehouses and things like that. Um and you normally use those data warehouses to consolidate the information mm. from various different packages so that all of that can get set, fed into a separate dashboarding package or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, and because of the amount of data involved and because of the difficulty of um, the data being stored in different formats and and needing to be normalized into one view, mm. that all takes time and it's normally an end of day process or something yeah. like that. Um, Invariable within the systems that if you're a large scale firm, um, sort of a large enterprise law firm, you've got so much data that actually internally an individual system may take a while to churn mm. through data itself. But if it's all in one place, you can normally query it quicker. Yeah. Um, and it, and it's, it's, it's not doing away with that. I mean, the data warehousing and stuff is you know standard practice and Mm. and you use the right tools for the right jobs in those circumstances but it's a way of actually keeping relevant information together Mm. better yeah no i I think i agree the other thing i wanted to read from this article briefly is 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 quite touching really and uh, you don't often get uh, feel good stories out of out of these articles but I, i i quite like this so Peppermint founder Arlene Adams admitted that the Circa 700 staff firm, presumably Blake Morgan they're talking about there, Blake Morgan, yeah. has suffered from Peppermint's inexperience in the sector. Quite telling for the founder to say they've suffered from. Yeah. Um, commenting, we are small and learning and investing heavily in scale. We don't have all the answers at the outset. Well, a couple of things strike me from that. The article says that they Blake Morgan, when they were Blake Lapthorne before they merged with Morgan Cole, signed up with Peppermint in 2013. So they've signed up in 2013. There've been issues. She's saying here, I've admitted, you know, we don't have all the answers. We're starting, we're scaling up. I don't know when Peppermint was founded, but I don't think it was too long before that, 2010, I think. Yeah. So there they are, you know, a, a relatively fresh startup company and they've been, you know, they've had the loyalty of the firm, which is fabulous yeah. to see. And and now they, the firm is going to be benefiting from the scaling of that platform. Yeah, and I, and I think that's a key thing for firms looking to invest in technology, which is supplied by startups mm. and things like that, in that, you know, there's potential mistakes may be made. They may be in experience in the sector, but actually... If you stick with them, if you yeah. work with these startups, actually the end result could be much better for you. Yeah. I mean, I know, again, from a lot of experience, even with organizations buying established off-the-shelf products, mm. there's often still significant yeah. headaches in implementing those products. <laughs> and the problem that you have with a large established product is getting changes made and getting fixes put yeah. in um, on a big organization is very difficult. Mm. Um, if you're using a product which is used by thousands of other people, that organization supplying that project is very slow to implement changes because it has a much bigger effect on their whole yeah. customer base. If you're going with a startup yep. and their customer base is much smaller, you have much more influence yeah. on how yeah, those fixes and the enhancements to that product get made and that's a very powerful thing Indeed. so yes you may lose some of that industry experience initially and there may be teething problems with it but the opportunities are so much better yeah um i feel and this you know is a clear indicator that that is the case absolutely um, yeah and i think it's i think it's wise for the startups to embrace that as well and to and to understand that the, that yeah. themselves that know they are inexperienced in the sector mm. and embrace that and and say we are but 
because we are on much smaller scale, we can change much quicker. We yeah. can adapt faster. Absolutely. Yeah, it's very encouraging. I suspect maybe that's an example of why, or sort of a precursor maybe to some of the incubators and accelerator things that we've seen coming out is you know firms are now recognizing that they've got to work with um, the technology yeah. startups and they'll get a better result. One final quote from that article, um, following consolidation of their practice management systems into the Peppermint platform, Blake Morgan can now switch their focus to continuous improvement and opportunities to enhance client experience. What jumps out of that is the phrase continuous improvement. You see that everywhere in things like lean project management, lean Six Sigma, all those sorts of fads that are going around. Um, but, 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 you know, very genuine process improvement systems. Yeah. Um, so it's relevant for them. They will, they will be benefiting from, from this idea of continuous improvement. We will come on to that in a, it won't be in this show, but it'll be in a future show where we start to enhance and develop the idea of this project management aspect, which we talked about, and we will start this week. Yeah. We will work our way into that sort of stuff later on. Yeah. No, so okay. Good so go on to item two. Yeah, we're going to item two. So this is a, um, uh, from Lexology, we, we found this article and, and it's something that we thought was a really interesting thing to talk about because we maybe don't agree with most mm. of the, uh, information provided by it, but, um, this is, uh, it's titled 30% increase in probate claims are DIY wills to blame. Hmm. Um, so I'll just, again, read a couple of the first paragraphs from this, this report. Um, and I think this was reported or, or written by uh, Burkett's LLP. Um, and it goes on to say, in 2018, the High Court recorded a staggering increase of 30% in the number of issued probate disputes on the previous year. Many industry practitioners believe that the rise in DIY wills is to blame for the sharp increase. Christina Blacklaws, president of the Law Society, has stated that with the range of different estates and circumstances that exist, it is vitally important people consult a professional when writing their will. Probate law is complex and DIY wills can easily contain mistakes which render them illegitimate or difficult to administer. Um, so a, a, a couple of key points where they're, they're bringing up on, on the downside of DIY uh, wills. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we wanted to pick up on this a bit. Uh, firstly, to say, you know, this article states that many industry practitioners believe that the rise in DIY wills is to blame for mm. the sharp increase. Um, there didn't seem to be any evidence supplied to suggest no. that that was actually the case. It seemed no. to just be a belief. So whether it's true or not, we don't know. No. Um, but also things like um, probate law is uh, complex and DIY worlds can easily contain mistakes. I mean, what's from your side, what's your thoughts on, on, on this aspect of things? And well, I, yeah. do you agree or, or, or I, not with this? I'm not a probate lawyer. So, and it's been, let me think, I'm not sure if I can do the sums in my head quickly. I don't know, 15 years since I studied anything to do with probate, but you know, things obviously change and move yeah. on. They will move on faster than my area of law, but I don't necessarily agree that it's a complex situation. If it were complex, if it were genuinely complex, I don't think you would get firms offering wills for £100. Now, I might be wrong in thinking that those firms are just going to do that work at a loss to attract private clients into their firm. But I would question, A, the future of those firms if they're prepared to do that. Because yeah. what else, what other legal work are they hoping to attract other than maybe a, a conveyancing transaction, yeah. which is also under massive price scrutiny. So I don't think it is that complicated. And I think if if looking at it from the other angle and saying, I, I want to rely totally on my lawyer and many wills are prepared by people who are not lawyers. Um, there is no requirement to have a will done by a lawyer. So um, you do get a lot of people who maybe don't have the right experience doing this. Um, you know, you wouldn't go into a law firm and say, I expect you to draft this thing from scratch. You'd say, well, I assume you've done it before. And I assume you've yeah. got a bank of precedents that you're going to use. And so... Whether you use a person or, or a program, you are going to expect clauses lifted from precedents and historic versions of things. Yep. And the question really is, how up to date is the information that goes into it? I mean, anything that really changes, and I might be missing the point, but 
is the tax whenever the chancellor comes out and hangs up his suitcase and uh, his briefcase sorry and says here's the new changes to the tax rules yeah. that needs to be taken very very closely because that's what people are writing wills for right to avoid their inheritance yeah. tax and but also to make sure their estate goes to the right place i think for most people let's guess at 95 percent plus of people they are either single married uh and or have a relatively close family so in 95 percent of the cases a straightforward will that leaves your estate to somebody else is going to tick most of the right yeah. boxes now you can get more complicated as the family gets bigger maybe there's family breakdowns uh maybe there's a load of money that you know you need to try and put into trust to shelter from the tax man if that's what you're trying to do yeah those situations um yeah maybe a diy product is not right because what the, what the human can do that maybe a, a platform can't do is look at you and look at me and go, okay, there's a man who's in his nearly 40, sadly. Um, and, uh, <laughs> nearly 40. Nearly 39. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> there's a man who's 39, clearly. So, yeah. you know, he, he, he's probably not on his first house. He, he may or may not have any kids. He's probably still got parents around, you know. So they will know, they can look at you and say, these are probably your circumstances, and so these are probably the questions I need to ask you. And maybe that cuts through some of the questions, but there's yeah. no reason at all, in my view, why you couldn't just say question number one on your DIY platform. How old are you? Or, you know, what are your personal yeah. circumstances? Are you married? Do you have any kids? I think that the advantage to a person is, that, but you can very quickly, though, say have you thought about situations like and i'll give you an example of one so um a per this is a personal example i won't use any of the names but um a, a brother a group of siblings whose um, mother passes away they're left with a the father the father gets remarried um and then he passes away fairly shortly after well all of his estate goes into his new wife's yeah um inheritance if you like and the children get nothing and actually the new wife has her own kids who inherit everything they effectively inherit the first group of siblings mother's estate now i don't think most people want that and maybe the diy wills don't say well oh, have you thought about those kinds of no. circumstances but i what i would say to people is whenever you have a life-altering event you should be doing a new will anyway yeah so um, I don't think you can blame or point the blame necessarily at the at the product. Yeah, and uh, and it's one of the things that came up from doing this. Where, I mean, we talk a lot about um, you know hiring a, a solicitor can provide you know the tax saving advice mm -hmm. when you're crafting these wills. The tax saving advice is generally a moving target, though. Yep. If you had your will drafted twenty years ago, that tax saving advice probably is no longer relevant. It, it won't be. Yeah. Um, so, one, it's likely that a lot of these situations come in because even if you used a solicitor at the time to draft your will, mm. unless you've decided to keep it up to date, it's probably out of date and not yep. relevant yep. to those rules. Um, and also. Is this related to a generational thing as well? Um, I know from my parents' generation, it was much more commonplace to go to the solicitor to get your wills drawn yep. up and things like that. Um, in later generations, I'm not sure people think about it as much anymore. Um, so no. is it because the people that are, for want of a better phrase, who are dying now at mm. younger ages and stuff just don't have these wills in place. Is this what's causing these probate issues? Mm. Um, yeah. And in which case you could say that actually these DIY wills actually give you the opportunity to more simply create one, yeah. put one in place where you may not have done beforehand. Yeah. So, so it gives you easier access. I mean, I know from experience... If I, I very rarely think about going to a lawyer for anything other mm. than selling my house. Yeah. yeah. And that's probably for most people, that's the only time they'll speak to a lawyer. Yeah. Um, unless 
they're doing lots of PPI claims or something like that. I don't know. That seems to be a common thing. The, Those are not the, lawyers. Are they not lawyers anymore? I, I don't want to. I don't want to <laughs> go against anyone in the audience with that phrase. But yeah, yeah, yeah we'll <laughs> yeah. we'll we'll take that as a uh, as read. That yeah, come no, back from my coding monkeys just uh, phrase last last week. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it, it's. I mean, that is the case. People don't really think about going to lawyers no, for things anymore. Um, and yeah, is it? Do these do DIY wills and that actually give you the opportunity to, to get something in place without that, you know, thinking you have to spend yeah. lots of money. And I think it's better to have it than not. And as you're saying, if, if sort of in 95% of the circumstances, it, it probably mm. is better. Um, yeah. Then, well, yeah, it, it's worthwhile, I think. And we know of our own, from our own friendship group of somebody who, who sadly passed away without making a will. And the, the, the sad fact is that he didn't go and see a lawyer and it, it could have gone, but you know circumstances were that that was never going to happen um unfortunately didn't do a um didn't do a, a diy will either but had he done so it would have at least meant that what he had went to where he wanted it to go yeah and without that it didn't so you know um you you can question whether they whether they they cause issues i'm sure they will and in some cases but i think First of all, they're better than nothing, probably, yeah. um, because at least you get to express some intention in a in a in a good way. I, but it's like anything, I suppose. You know, there are probably dozens of different DIY will um, yeah. uh, products out there that you can use. You can go into the supermarkets and buy a paper one off the shelf, which you could a few years ago. I haven't checked recently, so there are lots of different types. Um, I mean, I suppose if you go into the supermarket, check how long, how much dust is on the one in there, because that will dictate whether it's tax efficient. Yeah. Um, but look at look at your product and be be sure that you trust that, it, that they've got the right information in their in their platform to give you what you need. I yeah. guess. And I would argue that a lot of these things, you know, as family makeups change now, that you know, it's it's a lot different than it was several years ago. Yeah. The family makeups, the houses, and um you know mm. with increases in divorce and things like that that whole societal thing is getting more complicated so yeah. it may be that even if you spent lots of money anyway with your lawyer yeah five years ago ten years ago it may still be irrelevant now anyway so um i yeah. think that these diy lil- wills are a way of getting people to do it mm. who wouldn't normally do it and that's surely a good thing and if there are problems, those are things that can be addressed. You know, you yeah. can make these things better. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So yeah, so an interesting, an interesting thing. We don't necessarily agree with everything that they're, no. they're suggesting here, or whether it's all related to that being the fault. But uh, certainly an interesting topic, and something as things become mm. more automated, it's going to come up more and more with Bound to. everything in the legal industry. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so right. okay, so yeah, do we want to switch yeah. sort of tact a bit and and do a little. Sort of an introduction, I think, to to sort of legal yeah. project management. The, we'll go into uh, legal project management, and we might use a few examples. And because I'm a real estate lawyer, we'll probably talk about those. But the idea is to give people the framework rather than necessarily the specifics of real estate. But if you are a real estate lawyer, then fine, you know, use what we say. But or email in, like we said earlier. Um, but the idea is to start to think about what does your job and the, and the work that you're doing for the client entail and how can it most efficiently be done? I mean, that's the whole point of the, of, of the idea of legal project management, um, project management in general. Yeah. And so I've got a number of steps here and a few points that we just want to talk about um, that are suggestions for what, what you might do now if you don't have legal project management um, specialisms or expertise in your firm. Or you've never even thought of it. Or never, thought of it. <laughs> even better, yeah. Then yeah. what might you do now? And, and, and maybe people are doing some or all of these things, but these are my thoughts on what people ought to probably do. And so um, this, is, this is almost certainly going to be more relevant and more applicable where you're talking about... Um, jobs that can be repetitive and so that may well be will writing that may yeah. well be conveyancing there might be debt recovery or ppi claims sadly hence the reason why i think those things <laughs> only up are... until the end of august i think <laughs> that's <laughs> all right. then, then that's when we're rid of those so, so. until the next one yeah but um whatever it is that to the extent that you can repeat what you're doing on, a, on you know anything which has been looked at more than you know a few times ought to be systematized I suppose, and that's really what we're what we're talking about here. So, for me, um, step one A, if I can call it that, was to scope the job. 
and I've put here in headline terms, and also to make sure you're thorough about it, but not necessarily particular at this stage. So looking at a conveyancing transaction, I think the initial um, the initial part of that job, people might rush into thinking, okay, well, conveyancing job, I need to get the copies of the title in, get the searches off, get the inquiries off. And I would say, well, stop a minute, because what you really need to think about is, first of all, the customer comes and finds you and asks you for a quote. And you may have an automated quote thing online. If they've used week nine from us, you might have your yep. own Q&A with, a, with an automated yep. um, a quote machine on there, a chatbot that can do that for you. But if you haven't, you and even if you're doing something slightly out of the ordinary, you're probably providing, a, well, you're almost certainly providing a quote, and you should be under the new SRA rules anyway. Um, and being transparent on it for certain services. So the quoting is part of the job. The letter of engagement is part of the job and the setting up the file is part of the job. Not glamorous and not necessarily what people yeah. see. Certainly the client doesn't necessarily see all of that, um, the admin parts of it, but they are parts of the job. Then you can get into the job proper. And then, of course, at the far end and the tail end of things, once we finish this list, I mean, part of it, I'll give some of it away now, is to th carry out a post-transaction review of stuff. Now, that might be just feedback from the customer. It might be your own internal review, preferably both. But that in itself is related to that matter. And so yeah. it's part of the project. So there, you know, the, the, the sliding scale, the yardstick is not necessarily a yard. It's a bit bigger than that. I don't, yeah. you, can't really, you can't really do that, can you? It's, <laughs> it's a yard plus three inches. You know, it's bigger than people might think. So... Include all of those things that aren't necessarily immediately obvious. Um, but as I say, headline terms rather than the specific detail of what goes into those. Step 1B, I've put, consider whether any of those things in that scope are absolutely critical and necessary. Now, pricing obviously is, is critical and necessary. You might go through your points and say, why are we doing that? Or why are we doing that in that way? Could we do that thing in a different way? Um, and really challenge what everybody's doing. I mean, for example, reporting. Is it necessary that you report in a particular style? Could you report in some other style or as you go along? I mean, is it necessary to have one written report at the end? That's just an example. Um, yeah. you know, think about whether you can shave time but without shaving quality on any of the steps within that yeah. phase 1A. Yeah, and and is this um, does this come down to... Um, I mean, it, 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 it probably good to kind of start from this as well is why would you do legal project management? Why mm. is it important to do it? You know, what's the point if I'm a, if, yeah. if I'm a small firm or something like that? Um, you know, is there any need for me to do this thing? And, and these initial steps, and, and especially as you say, in that second step is probably the, the um, what I would hope is the, is the key part where you realize why you're doing this. Mm. Because... At the moment, most people, I would imagine, are going through their jobs because that's what they've always done for the past however long they've yeah. been working. Um, they always go through the same steps. They've never actually looked at those no, steps that's right. in, in great detail to see, do I need to still be doing this? Yeah. Um, and, and like you say, with things like the SRA's transparency rules coming in for fixed price, you can't figure out how you're going to quote for a bit of work unless you know yeah. how you do those bits of work. So yeah. is that what we're looking at here yeah. is to is to actually look at your job and say, am I doing all this stuff that I need to be or am I doing too much stuff? And, it's, and it, like it is that and absolutely it's that. And it, But I think it's also identifying the bits of the job where you can perhaps make the most improvements on saving time and or money and yeah. there are there is some stuff out there some research out there that dla have done and it's it's available on youtube if anyone wants to see it i can put a note up later on that, you know they say that they lose their money 45 i think they said 45 percent of the money that they reckon they lose is because they're doing work for which the client is not willing to pay and so part of this and coming into the specifics of it in a bit more detail in a second is yeah telling them what you're going to do and then you can have that conversation because if you if you just assume that you're going to do things in the normal way then maybe that's wrong yeah. for instance if you're going to buy a property for somebody um, let's say it's a developer and the developer doesn't need bank financing so the developer can make his own calls on what due diligence he wants to do maybe the developer has got more expertise about the site than you because he's been next door to it and just says i don't want any searches doing all i want to know is that the person that owns it owns it 
and I want you to execute the, the purchase. That's perfectly fine. But some firms might go, right, okay, well, I'm going to quote for all the, you know, the usual searches, stuff you do. These, and it could be completely waste, complete waste of time. And or some firms may go, okay, great, now that we're engaged, I'm going to go off and do those things and find that they're not going to get paid for them. Now, yeah. it might not just be in incurring searches because you ask or ask for money on account maybe to do those things. But you might be doing work which is not required, yeah. which is obviously a waste of time. And the idea here is to eliminate the wastes. Yeah. Um, so moving on, step 2A, get into the detail of the scope. And I, I go into the example. And what I want to do here is right at the outset also say you're breaking ap absolutely everything down to its, you know, to the most to the smallest reasonable uh, size that you can. And I, you have to be a judge to a degree of what that is. But I will just flag now, don't exclude general correspondence from this because correspondence makes up a massive amount of the time on a file. And all we're doing at the moment is saying, how much time am I dedicating to this matter? Never mind the value or anything like that. It's just how much effort and time am I putting into getting an instruction to the cash? at the end of the day yeah. and how can I get the most cash for the least effort is ultimately what we're aiming at right? yeah and, I, and so. I, I know from experience from buying houses when you know when we last bought our house and you know we were getting closer and closer to exchange yeah I pestered the lawyer a lot as to what is going on with this because I wasn't getting the feedback and I'm sure well, you probably know from experience that these pes <laughs> yes, pesky I, I know customers who, who, yeah. who keep asking these things that it takes time to respond to Of them. course it does. Um, so, yeah, I think you're right in saying that, you know, don't overlook that. That is a part of the job, dealing with annoying people like me who are going to ask yeah. you what's happening with this. It's, it's funny because, yes, that would be very annoying. But actually, I did exactly the same thing when, when I was did, selling. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, knowing what it's like doesn't mean I didn't do no. it myself. So expect it i guess is the answer yeah. that you're going and, to and, get. and factor it into your job and, and factor it in yeah. absolutely right because it is time that needs to be taken so sticking with the property um example of really drilling down into the detail of what you're doing so okay we've dealt with stuff like conflict checks and engagement letters that all needs to go on there and you could question who's doing all those things and I, we'll come on to that in a minute you, sh you should getting into the main part of the job so I always say to people, when you're buying the property, you're looking, you're doing your due diligence on it. And the due diligence is comprised, in my world, of three relatively distinct parts. And you could group them into looking at the title for the property, and the title registers, title deeds, um, looking at the search results that you submit. Those are things like the local authority search and so on. Yeah. And then raising the standard set of inquiries and looking at what comes back. Now, that if you if you break the property job down into the initial admin the due diligence phase you might call the due diligence phase level two or part two and then you might call um title 2.1 so think of it like you're having a sort of drop down menu if you like yeah and then take searches 2.2 for example you then have your local authority search and your drainage and water and your environmental and a few others those are all two point 2.1 or whatever and you keep going down like that within local authority search what are you looking for you're looking for a whole load of no's and then you're looking for the planning history and the building regulations consent certificates that you need so you know, if you actually look through all of those things what you do is you build up a very very long list of things that you actually do to get this transaction from start to finish and that's important for the reason to come on to in step four i think it is um so that's step 2A. And then again, step 2B, again, have another look through that list and go, do I need to do all of this? Are there any ways which we can save time and money? Now, it might be that you act for, let's say you act for a bank and you're financing these properties. Some lenders will say, we just need to do the jobs as quickly as possible. We're prepared to rely on a certificate from the customer's lawyer, or we're prepared to take search indemnity insurance. So question whether there are ways in which you can save money mm. for certain clients if the, if if you're doing enough work for them to warrant that level of investigation into what you're doing but but certainly do step 2a where you're saying i'm going to break the job down into as many component parts as i possibly can step three at this point i'd be looking at which of these parts of the jobs are value add and which are not and value add is difficult to define because 
whose eyes you you know are you looking yeah. at that with and i would say think of it from the customer's perspective which of these parts is valuable for the customer which of them is not and you're not saying i want to eliminate the stuff that's not valuable to the customer like the conflict check for example because you have to do it yeah. but you really want to make sure that you're focusing on driving down the time you're spending on the non value add the value add stuff to the customer is the regular reporting all that kind of stuff um, another example of non value add would be supervision so if you've got um, some you've got two different levels of staff working on it because you think that it should be resourced at a lower level um, well, can you substitute the supervision or some of the supervision for some kind of checking system that, you know, equal levels of staff could go, yes, that's been done properly because I've got the checklist here and it's, it satisfies the criteria. There are some levels of, of supervision that can be delegated down to a checklist. Yep. That's an example of how in future, and not for today, but in future, you could say, I can start now to push the work down to another yep. level. Because, I mean, we, we we talk about this kind of thing when we're looking at sort of AI solutions and mm. things like that, don't we? Whereby, um, you know, if you're looking at something like Raven AI, I know we talked before, these yeah. big contract scanning tools, um, you could say that actually, okay, well, all of the, rather than the lawyer who's dealing with this, mm. looking through the searches, I'm going to offload that work to one of these solutions. Mm. So that if the search is fine, it won't even need to be checked by the lawyer. Yeah. But if there's an f- issue, that gets flagged for the lawyer to look at, thereby you're only looking at those ones that you actually <clears throat> need to look at. Yeah. Now, for a lot of organizations, that's not going to be possible to implement a software solution to do mm. that kind of thing. But can you offload those to an associate or to a paralegal yep. who may not be able to make the decision on whether or not you know on a, on a complex mm. issue mm. in in those searches but would be able to tell if it's a complex search or not yeah uh, and so again just eliminates the ones you don't need to worry about absolutely yeah so that's that's looking at the resource really which is step four on my list is is what is the question the central question is what is the lowest point if you like on the sort of seniority scale that i can get the work done properly um, I emphasize the word, prop, word done properly. Um, it's not just a question of shoving it to the bottom and hoping that it's okay. You know, if it's a question of training the, the, the people who are at the bottom on, on all the skills that they need to be able to do it, to do the job properly. But you're identifying groups of people. So yes, you were thinking, okay, well, I'm the partner. I've got to sign the letter of engagement. True. You don't have to write it. Um, you know, there, there are certain things that you may think you have to do as the partner or as the senior person on the file, which you can delegate down, or at least you can just give it the once over and say, yes, that looks fine and move on. Um, So can jobs that traditionally done by partners be done by associates and can jobs by associates be done by paralegals? And then I think you're even looking from there, can jobs that are currently done by paralegals or even secretaries be done by technology and therefore automated? Yeah. Um, That is the whole point. And I guess the connection and the link between the project management and the technology that we're talking about. So, um, don't underestimate the training time and so on. Um, and when you're talking about level of resource, um, there's a great um, section in, a, in a, a talk by Mark Lasseter on project management that he's done. And again, I'll put a note, it's on YouTube, where he says, what happens is everyone dumps the work on the best paralegal. And the best paralegal is doing 12 hours a day. All the other paralegals are doing six or something. Yeah. Um, and that will be true for all levels. Uh, so, it's not necessarily identifying the person it's identifying the level of staff that you want it done and then making sure that all the people are capable of doing the work yep. um efficiently and um spreading the resource or spreading the work properly between the resource because if you end up overloading any individual person it won't get done or they will get stressed and leave yeah so um think about the level rather than the specific people so Having done all that, you've now got this very fantastically long list of everything that you're going to do, which you can then convert into something useful for the client. Um, And you can send them this list and say, these are all the things that I'm going to do for you that I think need doing. And you can allocate the price either to every single individual thing, which might be a bit over the top, or in the clusters like we've talked about. Maybe you break the due diligence down into the three levels that I mentioned. And, th- and this has basically given you, you know, the SRA are, are asking you to be transparent yes. on your pricing and stuff like that. 
this is how you get there. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's the scoping part of the job is really what they're interested in you doing, being yeah transparent on fees. You're saying, this is what I'm going to do. And this is what it's going to cost you. I personally think, and I don't think many people do this, the right thing to do then is to say, not this is what I'm not going to do, because that would theoretically be everything else, which would be pointless. Yeah. But maybe to say, these are the things that typically go wrong on files that I can't necessarily predict here until we get into the file. But that if it does go wrong, you know, we've thought about it, we're capable of dealing with it. This is the price that I think it will cost to solve it if it yeah. crops up, which is very often, I think, where people lose time and money. So, uh, and, and, and I think this was one of the points the SRI had raised with, with yes, people, it was, wasn't yeah. it? That, yeah. that, that people were becoming much, or firms were becoming much better at providing uh, transparent information of what a job would cost. Yeah. But leaving out all the, Ex- all the hidden extras. extras yeah. that all, all the hidden extras. That. So identify them up front because then you very clearly know what's within the scope and what's not within the scope. And it, and for example, um, you don't know that the road outside of the property is unadopted or you know is private until you've got the local authority search back. So you can't know that you're going to need to fix that problem either with a deed of easement which gives you the right of way or some other right granted somehow or you just insure against it. You can't know that you have to do that work, but you can certainly say, I've come across it before, and if it does come up, it'll cost you X to fix that problem. Yeah. So then you have a very clear list for the customer, and the customer knows. Now, the the second advantage to do not only you might hopefully recover the fees more and the client's more comfortable with it, it doesn't then necessarily have to fit in your, this is what it costs to do the job thing. I think a lot of people are scared to include those things in their quotes because they think they will then be priced out of doing the work. Yeah. Well, you know, you're better off to price it in the sort of, subcategory that might crop up and not necessarily include it in your headline fee um, than to say nothing about it at all yeah and then and then what happens when the 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 clients look at this lovely list of things and says that looks fantastic but i'm not prepared to pay that yeah it's too expensive for me then you then you have a choice either you trust your judgment don't you that you you're the expert and know what it's going to cost and 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 to a degree the first time people do this it will be finger in the air um, and maybe sometimes people are prepared to do that. But again, the other 55% of the time that DLA write off, according to them, is discounting um, and cumulative discounting. So the first one doesn't necessarily kill you. It's the repetition of doing that. You then also set the expectation for any repeat customers that that's the price you charge. So my personal view is, I mean, especially in an industry where everybody's busy right now, is to say, well, you know, the, the I've priced everything. I've gone into as much detail as I possibly can. Um, there isn't a discount available, but I can certainly omit certain parts of the work for you if you'd like. And it comes yeah. down to demand and supply, doesn't it? You know, um, if you go to a builder, they don't discount for you as far as I'm aware. And unless you want them to not do certain parts of the job, you know, tell them you don't need them to paint the outside of the house. You do it yourself. There's no reason why it should be any different for a for a lawyer and you don't go into the supermarket and say well i want to make this tagliatelle but i don't want to pay this much for the pasta you know it just doesn't happen yeah. so, so um, and what I, I guess what you're saying as well is that once once you've clearly broken this thing down mm. um you're you're more able to say okay well we can admit this this and this exactly and this will be your cost saving for yes. doing that and you're putting the onus back on the client then to decide that actually yes that's what they want to do yeah uh, and understand that it will cost them less, but there's these items that will be... Yeah, you'll committed. be doing less for it. Yeah, you'll be yeah. omitting certain parts of the work. Absolutely, yeah. So that is the sort of, you know, the first phase of what we're talking about. Now, I just want to mention again, go back to this Mark Lasseter um, lecture, which we'll, we put on. The lecture he gave to the yeah. Colorado State Bar Association. And we've talked about this before as well. The client expectations are always... I want it done faster and cheaper, but no compromise on quality. Well, he very neatly, he references that. Um, I don't think we can take credit for that necessarily, but no. he talks He talks <laughs> about the quality is really within, in the people that you have. The speed is really about the process, which he likens to the project management, the legal project management. And the cheapness or cost is pretty closely aligned to the technology that you use to bring you know bring the cost down overall and and what's nice about that is when people are saying i want it done cheaper the only way to really do that is to cut the number of people you have in your firm so that you can then cut your costs but if you do that you produce less work you cannot cut the number of people in the firm and still do the same amount of work unless you delegate the work to a process or a technology tool so 
um, that finishes neatly the bit that I wanted to say, which is that, you know, if you are looking at higher profits ultimately because you've got lower overheads or rather not lower overheads, but just the ca the capacity to take on more work with your existing um, employment, you know, your, your existing um, staff yeah. um, and scaling up for w with what you already have, it really must come down to utilizing the, the legal project management and technology tools that are out there. Um, and and making making best practice out of them. Now it's difficult because this sort of thing is not fee earning, and therefore it's not at the top of anyone's list. No, but you can see that once you've done that once for you have to do it for every single thing you're doing. Yeah, that's, that is repetitive. So if you're buying, you're also selling. Um, if you're you know if you're um, acting for landlords, you're also acting for tenants. If you've got corporate department, you're buying and selling and adding new directors and firing directors and. You've got to do it for everything. Um, some things will be longer than others. Yeah. The engagement and post-completion stuff might have similarities, certainly where you're doing the quoting and the conflict search and the letter of engagement. That can be used throughout every transaction you do. There, there shouldn't be really any much difference between those. Uh, well, the quoting will be different, I suppose, but the, the, the sort of the engagement and the conflict check should be similar. So once you've done bits of it, it would it will get faster and faster, but it... It really does take a lot of effort, but yeah. it it doesn't necessarily have to be done in one go. No. I mean, like we said, there are various steps in there. We identified four steps, and we've broken down steps one and two into into two parts. But it it, it can be done, and of course, we'll have the resource to help. Yeah, and and it, it, we want to touch on again, you know, that initial stage of okay, well, what what's why would I do this? What's the point in doing this legal yep. project management? It doesn't seem like anyone that's interesting. Well, you know, what we're showing is that actually people are being pushed into this anyway because you're having to be more transparent with your yep. pricing and quoting and things like that. And to be able to be more transparent with that pricing, you have to have a good handle on what the job is. Yeah. And to get a good handle on what the job is, you have to do this. Absolutely. So, you know, you may not think that actually legal project management from the sense of I'm going to change the way I do my mm. business is relevant to you but actually those first stages of let's figure out how I yeah. work at the moment you can start with that yeah um, and that can be your then introduction into it once you've done that you've then got your ability to be transparent with your price and meet those SRA guidelines mm. and things like that and then you can say well actually you know mm. we've done this that worked okay what are the next steps I yeah. can use for yeah. that? And uh, and that's been clear with a lot of the things we're doing. Mm. This is your introduction to the things. Yes, it is, yeah. And it gets you going, and then you can take those next steps if you need to. Yeah. Well, as an example of what next step might be, once you've gone through the process of, you, you do the buying of property checklist that we've just talked about, um, and you've broken the due diligence down, as we mentioned, into you know steps 2.1, 2.2, or whatever, Um what you can do eventually is think about, well, how am I monitoring how much time I'm spending on those? Now, all time recording solutions that I've yeah. ever heard of, they record in six minute units. You don't have to record that way. And we've talked about, was it last week or the week before, when it, last show yeah. or the show before, where we were talking about um, maybe doing away with time recording as far as the client's concerned and you're just using it as an internal measure because clients yeah. are expecting fixed fees now. And if you, if you give them something like this, they're not going to give two hoots as to whether you've spent... No you know, an hour or one hour, half an hour on something. Yeah. They, they just won't care because you've said, this is what I'm going to do and this is how much I'm going to charge for that. But if you are recording um, with, I think some American firms even charge 15 minutes units. I've no proof of that, but I've heard that before. I hope not, but um, maybe that's why they're all doing so well. Maybe, yeah, that's why they have those. I've, I've, again, I've, I've watched Suits and they well, have all these the nice evidence glass is offices. So I, I believe that's a fly on the wall documentary. So, so if you record in 15 minute units, you get yeah. to wear fancy suits and, and also drink whiskey in the yeah, evenings. And have a York. corner office in New York. <laughs> yeah. Easy, easy, easy. But, um, I should Sorry, have been, I, I should have been a lawyer. <laughs> yes. um, I forgot what I was going to say. In that. Yeah, no, yeah. no. So going back to the idea of the time recording, or at least monitoring what you're doing. I mean, with the way that we, that we will work is we will say when you're looking at the platform, you know, you're really just recording your time in that matter, um, and then eventually, as you start to itemize the tasks that you're doing, is there any reason why your case management solution can't say? 
you took 30 seconds to do your priority search, maybe maybe longer than that, but your secretary does your search and you look at it and say, that's fine, 30 seconds. Um, yeah. Or, you know, that's not a six minute unit. And I think people would be reluctant to necessarily break down the job in at that level of detail. They might group priority search into pre-completion searches, for example. Well, okay, but that, that you, you then might be justified in recording one unit rather yeah. than 30 seconds. Um, but it doesn't have to be recorded in six minute units. It can be recorded in another way. And then you can start to really look at it and say, well, actually, I've told the last five people that I'm going to charge 250 quid for looking at the local authority search. There'll be some people whose jaws just dropped when they, yeah. when they just, whatever the figure is. Yeah. Um, I've spent an hour looking at this thing because it's quite big and it's for a new build development site. Well, actually, that might be an exception. But generally, if you're spending 250 quid, or you say you're going to charge 250 quid and you only spend 200 or 150 or something, then you've misquoted in the wrong way and you maybe maybe you adjust your price to be more competitive yeah. or the other way around. You know, if you if you think it takes you, oh, I, I only ever look at the environmental reports, it takes me one unit to realize it's got a pass certificate and I never read beyond the first page. Well, you know, for shame, but yeah. also... But also um, you know, it you, you can you can properly gauge then you actually have the information. It goes back to the data thing which we talked about way yeah. way back. Um, you actually have information then on which you can base proper decisions. You know, even if the customer doesn't accept what you're saying about price, you then at least know what it's costing you in terms of time to do the work. Yeah. And you can adjust accordingly. Yeah. No, it's it's great. So hmm. we're gonna um we're gonna look at expanding on this in, yeah. in some later episodes as well and we'll we'll try and start putting some of this information up as well so yep. that you can, you know, potentially download some sort of white papers and, and mm -hmm. things um, that go, that you can take away from here yep. and uh, and use. And, of course, you know, get in touch with us if you want to know more or if you, Absolutely. you, know, you want to engage with us on this kind of thing, we can we can help with these these kind of yep. these kind of things. And if anyone wants the materials that we'll have, it's contact at panachesoftware.com or panachecast at panachesoftware.com, yep. either of those, and we'll pick up the emails. Yeah, um, and we look at those. Um, we had a couple of we had a couple of events on here. I'm not going to go into much detail because we're we're burning through time rapidly, yep. and uh, we we try to run them shorter, but we always end up overrunning anyway. It's that enthusiastic. Yeah, and um, we've got a, a project <laughs> management um, event on the the 10th and 11th of July, um, and a introduction to law take event on the 4th of July uh, which is at the Law Society in London uh, which is free to attend uh, won't go into detail of those I'll put the links in yeah. the uh, descriptions and things so if you if you're interested in those pick them up um, but yeah we'll we'll expand more on legal project management in the next episodes uh, and we'll also try and look at doing some other sort of tech related mm. uh, episodes as well and yeah uh, and get some more information out there for you to use as we did on episode 9 yeah yeah mm. Great. Okay. okay. Well, and I would say until, until next, next week, week yeah. but uh, we, 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 we won't until be here next week. We, we'll be here um, unless we put out any of the sort of extra shows and stuff like that, which yeah. we, we might look to do as well. So, yeah. um, but other yeah. than that, we'll be here sort of twice a, um, twice a month. Until next um, fortnight. Until no? next fortnight. I'm not sure that sounds <laughs> right, but uh, we'll, we'll figure out, we'll figure out the branding yeah. later. That's exactly. Fine. Um, okay. Well, until next time. Yeah, until next time. That's easiest. Yeah. yeah we'll, we'll catch you later. See you then. Okay. Bye. Bye. bye.